Doctor Jacques. Doctor Jacques, are you there? Uh, uh, well, welcome back from the break. Uh, once again, we are very sorry for the for the internet. I mean, uh, I'm not sure I've experienced this in a very. In fact, I've never experienced this for two uh, internet stuff to fail at the same time. Uh, but once again, we are very sorry. Is mainly because of the of the current weather. So uh, I was talking about forms of violence, and I said that we have four basic types: direct violence, which is also referred to as physical or behavioral violence, contextual, or structural, or systemic violence, and also cultural and attitudinal violence. Now, direct violence. Examples include killing, beating, maiming. Contextual or systematic violence. Examples are deprivation of life essentials, marginalization and A and, and so on. And we also have cultural violence. And let's look at them one after the other. Um, direct violence first. Direct violence refers to the use of physical force against another's body, against their will, and it is expected to inflict physical injury or death upon that person. So when we beat, when we maim, when we physically attack people, all these are examples of physical violence. Physical violence is expected to bring harm to somebody's mind or body, direct harm. When we use physical violence uh, in things like torture, rape, mutilation, and so on and so forth, it could be a threat to life itself. We use physical violence sometimes to coerce or to enforce, to, to coerce influence over the victim. And physical violence is the most popular form of violence in our families, organizations, communities, societies at large. We see it every day. We see perpetrators, we see victims, and we see witnesses. Sometimes, in fact, any time there's a case of physical violence, we are playing one or a combination of these roles. We are either the perpetrators, the victims, or we are witnessing it as observer. Harmed conflict is an example of physical violence. Like I said earlier, we also call it direct or behavioral violence. Now, the second type of violence is called structural or contextual violence. You see, unlike physical violence, unlike physical violence, uh, Direct violence is not so visible. Is not so visible. And usually, physical violence at its foundation 
in structural or contextual violence. And structural violence refers to unjust, unequal, or unrepresentative social structures and processes and situations. We see them in our laws, in our political system, in our economic uh, asymmetries, in the way we arrange our organizations, in the way we arrange our societies that deprive some people, that marginalizes some people, that gives some people undue advantage over other people, over other people. All these are examples, they are ways of uh, structural violence. All these, they are indicators of structural violence. For instance, in some of our communities, in some of our communities, certain groups are giving advantage over other groups. For instance, let's say in the local government where we have three communities, one is the major community with high population. Sometimes the position of local government chairman is like totally, is absolutely reserved for them. And when they dish out contracts, employment, scholarships, it's usually for the people within their community. Sometimes in our families, we have some policies that favor uh, some children, maybe because of their sex, at the expense of others. In our organization, there are laws we may not be aware of their impact. There are laws that deprive some people of some rights, of some benefits. In our country, there are government laws, there are government policies that have deprived certain group of certain benefits. A good case in point, many years ago, is the case of the Niger Delta people, where we take billions of naira or dollars worth of oil and we are not plowing back to them. I did research there many years ago and I found out that even as, as, as late as 2011, some popular communities in the Niger Delta, they are not connected to the national grid. They don't have what we call NEPA or power holding. They use So this is an example of uh, marginalization. This is an example of uh, structural violence. When we deprive people of certain opportunities, when we, when we work with laws and policies that give some people undue advantage over other people. Now, Cultural violence, cultural violence. Okay, before I go into cultural violence, uh, structural violence are less obvious. They are less obvious forms of violence. And many times they are difficult to address. They are difficult even to identify and also difficult to address. It takes sensitivity, special sensitivity by a leader be able to see how, how the way, how structures or the way some things are done in the group is depriving some people of certain benefits. Uh, i give you a quick example. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> some years back, many years really, I wanted to take my group to uh, IGP camp in Abuja, uh, internally displaced persons camp in Abuja. And uh, I was asking the camp uh, I said I was taking my group 
to to a camp, IDP camp, we wanted to go and distribute certain certain materials to them in Abuja. And I was asking them what material they need for their for their people. And uh, the management were telling me, I mean, normal food item, this one, that one. I said, fantastic. And I said, what about, what about a uh, sanitary pad? What about sanitary pad? What about baby food? What about this and that? And they were like, wow, we never thought of that. Um, and they didn't think of that because they were more, mostly concerned with uh, the general needs of men. However, they forgot that women have certain special needs. Women have certain special needs that must be taken into consideration. They forgot that children also have special needs that must be taken into consideration. So it takes special sensitivity for a leader to see structural violence. Cultural violence refer to those things in our culture, those aspects of our culture that we used to justify or legitimize both physical and structural violence. Uh, there are certain beliefs in our culture, there are certain practices in our culture that support physical violence. There are certain aspects of our culture that support structural violence. Thank God now that things are changing, but there were times when male child education was favored over female child education. Because we say that a woman, we end up in our husband's, husband's house. However, thank God things have changed now in modern times. But be that as it may, be that as it may, uh, there are still cultural violence everywhere. Uh, my late dad, my late dad, Alaji Bayo Akinade, um, he has this elder sister, uh, the firstborn, who, mama, mama is a brilliant woman. If you sit with mama, I mean, you know that, ah, if this woman has been educated, she could have been a professor. And one day you are talking, she now narrated to me the event that led to her not being sent to school. That my grandfather, that is her dad, actually cherished Western education and wanted to send her to school. The day she was to be taken to school, maybe with my dad or with some other people, my grandfather's your far younger brother, who happened to be her own uncle, came and said, ah, Baba, my brother, why do you want to waste money on sending a female child to school? After all, she's going to end up in another man's family. And that was how she lost the opportunity of uh, Western education. Uh, the story I shared she should be in her late 70s or early 80s when she was telling me that story. And we could still feel the pains in her eyes, in her face that, ah, that's an example of cultural violence. She wasn't the one that made herself a female. She was born and she found she's a female. My own dad, wasn't the one that made himself, there was nothing he did that made him a male. He was just born like that. So why should an elder sister who also has abilities, intellectual abilities, 
why would she be deprived of Western education and this younger brother be given Western education? Just that's cultural violence, cultural violence. That, like I said, has decreased now. That's the, 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 the type that was meted out to her. But generally, cultural violence still persists <clears throat> within our environment. Cultural violence still persists in our environment. Attitudinal violence, the fourth category, refers to mental processes, feelings, attitude values that people hold, which in themselves may not be violent, but they may be sources of violence or they may allow violent behavior and institutions to operate without challenge. So we see that when people have feelings of hate, fear, mistrust, like what we have that is pervasive now, especially during this political election period, we are suspicious of ourselves. Uh, people, I mean, people have been crying foul, over an election that is still more or less ongoing. You see, all these are, and people are already calling for war. People are already using, I mean, violent words to describe each other. This is what we refer to as attitudinal violence. Many times, all these forms of violence, they are connected. For instance, a man, a husband that is beating his wife, if we check it very well, we may find out that there is violence, he has attitudinal violence. And this attitudinal violence is now a support for cultural violence. And then, like that, cultural violence supports structural or contextual violence, and then the man exhibits it through physical violence through physical violence. So many times as conflict managers, when we are confronted with a conflict that has turned violent, we want to trace the roots of the violence. When we are confronted with violent behavior, we want to trace the roots. Is it in the attitude? Is it in the culture? You know, part of culture, Part of what influence our cultural, uh, influence cultural violence and attitudinal violence, they are our traditions, our religions, our religions. <clears throat> I remember many years ago, it's over 20 years now. Hello, can we hear me please? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, thank yes, you. Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. you. Oh, thank you very much, Mark and Sass. Many years ago, it should be close to two decades now, or oh, a little over. A cousin of mine, older than me, uh, she was getting married. She was in a car. And then the, the mom that came to join them presented her husband with a gift. And that gift was a horse whip, a horse whip, Koboko, Bilala. And she said, this horse whip is what you will use to kill the remaining madness in your wife's head. Because every woman comes from her father's family, her father's house, with some remnant of madness. The father has cured part of the madness but the remaining madness, it is the responsibility of the husband to cure it. And this horse whip, horse whip. The husband and the wife, they were they are learned, they are graduates. And when he presented it, uh, people just laugh. Hmm. What that imam, we know his intention may be good. His intention is control your wife, train your wife. To best suit you or whatever uh, you are the you are the head, whatever. But he has communicated violence to the couple. If 
I don't know whether the husband eventually used it on my on my cousin, but that that's a license to him for physical violence. You can beat your wife. That's what he has been told. And look at it coming from a religious authority, from a religious leader. But we see that that thing was rooted in culture. The belief that, oh, women are like this. You see, this is how all these things are connected. Now, if such a woman, if such a man now beats his wife and they bring it to you as a conflict manager, if you don't trace it to the level of his imam giving him this, you may not know why the man is giving like that. But the man now has spiritual authority to whip his wife with a horse whip, with Bilala. Okay, this is another thing I want us to consider is a behavioral change exercise. Is a behavioral change exercise. Um, I want us to look at these four forms of violence. Which type exists in your relationships? In your relationships, in your relationship with your spouse, in your relationship with your uh, children, with your siblings, with your parents, with other people. <clears throat> Which one? Is it physical? Is it structural? Have you been a victim of structural violence, of attitudinal violence, of cultural violence? Or are you a perpetrator? Are you a perpetrator of this? Or are you an observer? Are you observing from the sideline? Sometimes you cheer. Oh, yes, it's good. That's how to treat people like that. Which, which one? You see, this is an activity for reflection. It's an activity for reflection. This is the second one uh, we are giving you this morning. Uh, because of the time you have lost, because of the internet issue, you may not have the time to break to break for 10 minutes to do it and report back. But I want us to note it in our writing part. Consider how you perpetuate violence and what you need to do about it. But it's more than perpetuating. Consider also how you are being a victim of violence and what to do about it. What type of violence are you a victim of? Is it physical violence or other types? Or how are you being an observer of violence? How are you being an observer of violence? And what can you do about it? But more so, as Muslim leaders in our organizations, let's check where do we see structural violence? Are there laws? Are there policies that we too have been worried about? This thing is not fair. This is injustice to some people. This is unfair to some groups of people, to some of our members. You see? And look at it and see what you think you can do to address this situation. Many years ago, when we built our houses, when we built our structures, offices, residential houses, and what we just put there is only staircase, steps. But like 12, 15 years ago, we started becoming sensitive to the special needs of physically challenged people or differently abled people. And now we have ramp for them to wheel their wheelchair across. You see? And it has made life far easier, more, more accommodating for many physically challenged people. I used to work in a university, work in a university many years ago in the North Central private university. 
a new university then. So, I mean, all the infrastructure then. Then, about a year or one and a half years uh, after the school was founded, he employed an albino as a staff. The albino eventually became my friend, in fact, my office mate. Then we started noticing that we have not been sensitive to the special needs of people, of people with, I mean, disabilities. My albino friend, when he's trying to climb staircase to Senate chamber, to the office of the vice chancellor, the first day I was just looking at him. He was finding it difficult to place his steps. I just was joking. He had to now go to the vice chancellor, speak with him, and then they now painted the edges. They painted the edges of the staircase every step. And that was when my friend was able to walk uh, just like the rest of us. You see, something as simple as putting a red paint on the edges of the steps changes his experiences in the workplace. So what I'm saying is that there are things in our organizations, in our families that are eating, things that is making life especially more difficult for certain groups, for certain members of organizations. These are things we refer to as structural values. We may want to search them out in order to make our group more, more accessible, more accommodating for every member. Don't forget, Structural violence or systemic violence are difficult to discover. They are difficult to discover. And it is on them that physical violence uh, are usually rooted in them, that they are rooted. Physical violence. Uh, as I wrap up this, uh, my, my thoughts on this, um, there was a time when um, United Nations when they built IDP camps, they recite uh, toilets. They recite it a little bit far from where they put residences. I mean, what we think, I mean, that's common sense. We don't want to put toilets where people are. But they found out that it led to increasing rape. You see, Gender-based gender violence. In rape of women, before they now found a way of taking, I mean, so what I'm saying is that sometimes we do things out of good mind, but is affecting some people negatively. Okay, finally, non-violence. Non-violence. Non-violence refers to deliberate restraint from violence in conflict situations between two or more adversaries. You see, violence is an option to addressing conflict. Violence is an option. Non-violence is when we deliberately restrain ourselves from using violence in a situation of conflict, in a situation of incompatibility between two or more parties. It is also a philosophy and strategy for social change that reject the use of physical violence as a response to conflict, even when it is a viable option. This ongoing election, so who have already been mobilizing on how to physically attack people because of, oh, they suspect they have rigged this election, uh, they have done this, oh, they do this here, oh, they want to take over our town, so we will do this, we do that. Yes, all these conflicts are based on legitimate grievances, on legitimate incompatibilities. But we need not resort to violence to resolve these incompatibilities. And although nonviolence may seem weak to people, it is actually, studies have shown that it is far stronger than violence. And it has better outcome than violence. Nonviolence is not passivism, is not passive acceptance of oppression, 
or armed struggle against it. That is not what non violence is not suffering in silence. It's not suffering in silence. Rather, it is a pragmatic strategy, strategy that is taken as a better option than using violent force in response to conflict. And studies have shown that the outcome of non-violent strategies, uh, the outcome is two times better than the outcome of violent strategy. They studied uh, regime change, the, the, I mean, the big scientific study of regime change, regime change meaning that how they change governments, how they change government, some using harmed conflict, insurrection, terrorism, militias, uh, rebel groups, those are violent forces. And other people using non-violence means like demonstration, negotiation, uh, non-violence, uh, protest, and so on and so forth. You now look at it for over a period of 100 years. So they checked so many conflicts. They found out that using violent force, the outcome, the people succeed only 23% of times. With all the harm, uh, with all the ammunition, with all the violence, only 23% of time. And that such regime change collapsed before 10 years. You now look at non-violent method. They saw that it had 56%, between 54 to 56% chances of success. People succeeded more than half of the time when they use non-violent means. And that such regime change lasts far more than 10 years. Why is that so? Because when people use violence, like Boko Haram was doing, government had to respond with violence. The international community even joined government. But when people demonstrate peacefully, when they try to negotiate, they will now have more support. They have more support from local, international organizations. Now, when government lash out against these people with brutal force, such a government will now become unpopular. And gradually, before you know what is happening, the government may disintegrate. Many authoritarian regimes have been brought down all over the world through non-violent means. So, uh, there are other useful terms. Uh, those ones you can read them up when we have our, when we have the time. We don't have the time now. Uh, this ends the the first the first module. I don't know whether we have any questions or any comments so far before we go to the second module. Anyone? Okay. Uh, let's let's go to the second module then, which is understanding conflicts. Understanding conflicts. Um, as conflict managers, our understanding of conflict. Our understanding of conflict goes a long way in how we manage conflicts. Because how we understand it will affect our attitude to it. It will influence our orientation, orientation to it. It will influence our orientation to it. Okay. Um, we may want to we want to contact maybe through chat. We want to quickly contact some of our members that the network is now very stable at least with us here, uh, and they want to 
join back. We have 12 participants for some time now. We have only 12 participants. Okay. Um, module two, understanding, understanding conflict. We quickly look at the concept of conflict the other time, the first module. Uh, we saw what conflict means, but that was briefly. For a conflict manager, we need a more in-depth understanding of conflict. We need a more in-depth understanding of conflict. And uh, that's what we want to do now. So we want to look at it under the following subheadings. The essential nature of conflict, uh, stages, start and manifestation of conflict, and then cost of conflict. So um, this is where we need to talk briefly about our, our pre-course activity, our pre-course activity, the conflict world web. Uh, we were asked in our teams, I mean in our groups, to identify five words or phrases that come to mind when we hear the word conflict. I don't know whether members of group one, if anybody is around to tell us the words they came up with. What about group two? Group three. Uh, is anybody here from the groups who want to share with us the five words that they arrived at? Okay, it's all right. Uh, we'll come back to that. You see, the point here is that. Okay, does anyone want to uh, talk? Okay, I can see a uh, hand up. Thank you, Madam Khadija Tajay. Please, you have the floor. Hello. Okay. So, I'm already come to Live Arca too. Um, um, in group 10. Okay. Actually, I would like to just uh, discuss briefly about the five words that came to mind when I heard the word conflict. Uh, conflict, uh, I say it is a way you have a fight with uh, people. Okay, fight. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have a dispute, dispute? Um, clash. clash. Yes. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. I put it that way, like, I have some others was but at least the first those are five that came to mind. Those are the ones that I will okay. able to put down. Can you go over so the I don't know if I'm on the right uh, part or anything. But yeah. I'll be saying it this way that it's like some were actually having with your lecture. Some are Hello, Madam Ajayi. Busy yesterday, I couldn't go much on it. So really I good, think uh, I'm with you now. Yes. So you thank you for you. the opportunity given to me. Thank you very much, ma'am. Can you release those five words again? We lost you at some point. Madam Khadija. Okay, I can see your hand up. Uh, 
Okay, Madam Kadija, okay. can you go over the words again? Then we have uh, Mr. Lawa after you. Oh, okay. 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 You mentioned clash. Okay, uh, I think I, I tripped up at some points. Okay, I've been seeing the hand of uh, Mr. Lawal. Please but they are all correct. They are all correct. You said? Hello? Salam alaikum. Yeah, wa alaikum salam. Uh, the network for the past 30 minutes have been able to access. Well, I just I'm using his phone number. Uh, his okay. Phone. Okay, ma. Phone. So click. The first one is I also think of misunderstanding because if it had, there hasn't been misunderstanding. That would situation of conflict. Mm -hmm. Also, I, I think of a dispute. I'm in group 11. Dispute, when the mm -hmm. situation becomes confrontational, mm -hmm. there is bound mm -hmm. to be a sort of conflict. Mm -hmm. I also think of, I also have work. Yeah, I have work. So those, oh. those are the mm. <laughs> ones yeah. that uh, thank you, thank but, you. Uh, someone has already thank you very much, man. Uh yes, I can see another. I saw Mrs. Uh Madame Adepo's hand the other time. I already had my Oh, great, great, great. Thank you very much. Possible um, to have uh, two or three people. Okay, okay. Uh, so I know group uh, group 10. Which other groups? Group 11. Group 11. Which other group? I mean, group 10, too. 10, OK. So it's only group 10 and group 11 mm -hmm. people. OK, I can see the hand of uh, Mr. Salami Yakubu, and then also uh, uh, I saw Techno Spark. So let's have uh, Salami Yakubu first, and then we see that the Techno Spark, please. You have the floor, sir. Unmute yourself, please. Mr. Salami, please unmute and then you have the floor. Maybe he's not aware or he can't hear you. Yeah, okay. Uh, Sir, Technospark 7P, please, you have the floor, sir. Unmute yourself. Thank you. Oh, great. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi My name is Ibrahim. Yes, Ibrahim Fatai. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sukhan. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, the five words that I can uh, pick from the lecture. Uh, one, 
hostility. Mm -hmm. Hostility. Are you with me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Field. Field. As in F E U D. Field. Yes. Okay. Yes. Is instability. 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 Mm. Okay. Dispute. 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 Yes. Okay. And pandemonium. Uh, pandemonium. Pandemonium. Oh. Pandemonium. Thank you very much. Uh, which yes. group are you representing? Which group are you representing, sir? Group six. Group six. Group six. Group six. Thank you. Uh, I think Mr. Salami is not with us. Yes. Oh, Mr. Salami, if you can hear us, unmute and then tell us. Okay, thank you. Please go ahead, you have the floor. Mr. Salami, please unmute yourself. You muted yourself again. Okay, let, let's. There's a place written mute. Just pray. Okay, Madam Shakira, Oladejo, Agaza. Please, you have the floor. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi Yeah, sorry, I, my network was <laughs> bad a few minutes ago, so I wrote. My the words that comes to mind, I wrote them on the chat room. I can just repeat. Oh, great! Please. I'm from group one. Okay, good. Go ahead. Yes, uh, uh, with conflict. Apart from the words that have been earlier said, I have some more words like okay. friction, mm. disagreement, rancor, mm. warfare. Mm. Uh, this code. This code. So those are the other words. Yeah. Wow. Thank you very much. These are beautiful responses. Very beautiful ones. Um, Mr. Salami Yakubo, are you ready to unmute? Oh, wonderful. Please unmute yourself and uh, the floor is yours. Uh, okay, let's continue. Um, you see, <clears throat> we do this kind of activity for us to see our previous understanding and our attitude about conflict. If you check the words that the five words that most of us presented, if you want to check whether they are positive negative or neutral, positive, negative, or neutral, we see that majority of those words are negative. In other words, when we hear the word or the term conflict, we have negative associations with it. And this is powerful. In one of the trainings we had um, some maybe last year or two years ago, we now did arithmetic of the words. I mean, what percentage? We found out that more than 96% of the words suggested have negative connotation. In other words, an average adult has Every time he hears the word conflict, the word inspires negativity in him or her more than 96% of time. Oh, there's dispute between this person and that person. Ah, what we, the image we see is negative image. Oh, that is this. There is conflict between, oh, we are seeing discord. We are seeing pandemonium. We are seeing rancor. 
all these have negative uh, connotations. And these are implications for how we relate to conflict, for how we have, uh, help other people, other people handle their conflict. So, but let's look at the real nature of conflict by looking at its definition and then we break it down. Maybe we may begin to change our perception about conflict. Maybe our attitude, once our perception about the term conflict begins to change, maybe our attitude towards it also will begin to change. And once our attitude changes, our perception changes, we see that how we handle it will also change. That is very important because the outcome of conflict is largely dependent on how we handle it. Whether a conflict will become dysfunctional, that is negative, destructive, or it will be functional, that is positive and constructive, it largely depends on how parties in the conflict handle it. How parties in the conflict handle it is largely dependent on, dependent on their perception, on their attitude towards conflict. So let us disaggregate, let us disaggregate the term conflict. Conflict, as we said earlier, is the response we have when we perceive goal incompatibility. Conflict is how we respond when we perceive that there is incompatibility of goals. The incompatibility may be in ourselves. Oh, what do I want to eat? Do I eat rice or beans? The money I have, once I buy rice, I can't buy beans. Oh, who do I marry? This one or that one? Which job do I do? Who do I accept as friend? Once I accept this one, I can't take this one. Where do I go and spend my salad break? Once I go here, I can't go in there. So when we have that kind of incompatibility, it's conflict within us. And that is when we make trade-offs, we let go of some choices and accept some other. But beyond individuals, sometimes this perception of incompatibility is between individuals or group. And at that, conflict is a relationship between two or more individuals or groups who have or think they have incompatible goals who have or think they have incompatible goals. Meaning that there are some conflicts that is based on having incompatible goals. There are some conflicts that is based on thinking that we have incompatible goals. Whether it is real or thought about, that is imagined, it is perceived. Once, in, once incompatibility is perceived, it can be real, it can be only in the realms of thought, but it leads, it generates conflict. Especially when parties now begin to pursue these incompatible goals these incompatible interests or values. So when we try to dissect conflicts, when people talk about conflict, what we find as components of the conflict includes perception of incompatibility, perceived incompatibility, which can be imagined or real. Now, I can say with a level of, with a high level of confidence that many conflicts that we experience as human beings 
they only dwell in the realm of imagination. They are not real conflicts. I would want to say I'm prof, but I know. Last time I had conflict with somebody, I was sure. I was sure that he wanted what I wanted, and I wanted what they wanted. So it is incompatible, incompatibility. But the truth is, about 50% of the times when we, when we are in conflict, the conflict is based on perception, on, I mean, on imagination. Let me give you this story. Story of four people, four siblings. They needed, they felt all of them needed orange. Some for homework, home economics assignments, some for integrated science uh, for agri, some for pleasure. I mean, just for ordinary, I mean, to please himself. So the family is a family that likes oranges. So they usually have enough of it. But on this fateful day, nobody knows what happened. Uh, the four siblings, male and female, just woke up they need orange. And each one of them goes to the refrigerator where they normally keep the oranges to fetch one or some. Lo and behold, it's only one orange that is left in the refrigerator. So they started brawling. Oh, the orange is mine. I marked it. That's mark. I was the one that put it there yesterday. I was the one that did this. You know what will normally happen when children are fighting over something they feel they should have right over it. So here in comes their mother when she's been hearing noise. So, so she just comes in to look at what is happening. All of them, they tell her their story and how they must, how and why they must have the orange. Part of their story is, oh, I need, I need to submit my economics assignment this morning. If I don't, my teacher will beat me. Blue, black. I need to submit my integrated science. Oh, I need everybody with very convincing stories of why they must have the orange. Okay, the mother now went beyond, okay, you want to do economics, you want to submit to economics assignment. What exactly do you need the orange for? Why do you need the orange? Oh, the first child, a female says, I need the juice of the orange. My own economic assignment is to make orange juice. Okay, uh, the mother says, yeah, you can, the juice is there. Number two, I, I, so I want to do my economic assignment. Okay, what do you need it for? My economic assignment is to bake um, pie, to bake a pie, and I need the peel of the orange, the peel, the back of the orange, as spice, as scent, or aroma, or something. I need to add it to whatever I'm doing. Okay, so what you need, the mother says, what you need is the pig. Okay. Number three, what do you need? Oh, in our integrated science class, we are told to plant orange seeds, and you should go for special breed of orange. And I know that this one is a special breed breed from outside Nigeria. So what you need is what? Seed. Oh, yes, I need the seed. OK, the fourth boy, the fourth child, what do you need orange for? He says, you see, yesterday I over it. So I have constipation now as I'm talking to you. I need the roughage, the roughage of the orange to eat it so that it will aid my digestion. Now, 
in the real sense, do the siblings need to fight? Their incompatibility, is it real or only imagined? From the story, the, the answer is clear. The incompatibility is just imagined incompatibility. That's why I say that many conflicts we find ourselves in or we see other people that we experience in life generally, about 50% of it, about half of it, will be based on imagined incompatibility. Only the remaining 50% will be based on real incompatibility. But as conflict managers, whether the incompatibility is real or imagined, we have to treat the conflict the same way, just like the mother treated that case with, this, with her children. She listened, she helped the parties to identify, to identify what they really needed. And then she was able to show that all of them can have this thing. Also, another component of conflict is how parties talk about this perception of incompatibility, how they communicate their perception of incompatibility. Are they communicating in violent terms? Are they communicating in peaceful terms? Because having incompatibility in itself is not enough reason for people to start beating themselves. Sometimes the way we communicate will aggravate a situation. Sometimes it will calm the situation. Um, I know majority of us, if not everybody, we are Yoruba. You know that Yoruba will have this adage that addresses that. And we have sayings that address that. For instance, one of them is Pele, Pele Lako Ulabo, sorry as male and female. The female sorry is the one that we can't tension. For the male story, we aggravate situation, communication of perception. An adage in Yoruba says, oro, oro, oro rere, on yobi, lakpo, oro buruku, on yofa, lakpo, toto shibi uwe any daddies and mommies. In other words, good word will make people to give you cola nuts from their pockets. It will compel cola nuts from the, from the pocket. Whereas bad presentation will command arrow. Arrow from the, where, where, where do they normally keep arrow? I've forgotten the English name for where they keep arrow, uh, the, the shaft of the arrow. Uh, it's called Akpo in Yoruba. So Yoruba know, Yoruba people, we know that presentation goes a very long way. So in complex situation, how we communicate about this incompatibility goes a very long way in determining the nature of that conflict. Another important thing is how people act towards this incompatibility, their actions, their pursuit of these incompatible goals. Are they using peaceful means or violent means? So when we talk about conflict, conflict refers to a situation of perceived incompatibility, response to the perception, that is how we had communication and pursuit of incompatible goals. So, and this has, this understanding of conflict has implication, implications for conflict management. It helps us to know that when we talk about conflict, conflict is not only what people do, it's not only what people say, it goes, it's more than that. It goes to the level of how people feel, what they perceive. 
what they communicate and what they act towards incompatible goals in ourselves, in, towards incompatible goals in us, between us and other people, how we act towards incompatible goals between our group and other groups. So, response, perception, communication, and action towards incompatible goals, this is what conflict is about. Perception plays a very important role in conflict. The way we perceive the conflict or the incompatibility may lead to suspicions, fear, or zero-sum attitude. When we respond to incompatibility, we may decide to sacrifice the goal. We may decide to have other people have the goal and sacrifice our own claim to the goal. We may try to, excuse me, we want to hijack the goal. We may want to get the goal at the expense of the other parties. And when we, when we adopt this strategy, we want to arm twist, we want to fight, we want to threaten. The mindset here is that the right to have this goal is only ours. And we ignore the right, interest, and needs of the other party. That's when we now begin to pursue the hijacking of the goal. Thirdly, we may decide to negotiate. We may decide to sit down and negotiate this incompatibility or reach out to a superior to help us or to a third party who may not necessarily be superior, a credible third party to help us with these other parties to resolve this thing. When we respond in the third way, what it means is that we are recognizing the rights, interests, and needs of the other party in conflict. We recognize their rights to the goal. We also recognize our own rights to the goal. And we say, okay, let's jointly work out something that may be satisfactory to all, something that may satisfy the needs and interests of the other party. And this is a peaceful way of responding to conflict. This is a way of responding to conflict to make us uh, have positive outcome, positive outcomes of conflict. So as conflict managers, people aspiring to be conflict managers, when we uh, when a conflict is brought to our attention, when we are called upon to intervene in a conflict, we need to first of all determine what is the nature of this incompatibility. Is the incompatibility real? or imagined. We want to also determine what people, how the parties in conflict, what is their perception of conflict? How do they perceive conflict? How, do, how are they acting towards this conflict? So when we have this at the back of our minds, that is, first of all, determining the nature, I mean, the, the attitude to conflict, determining the nature of the incompatibility, and also the attitude of the parties to conflict generally, then we have at least three dimensions to work on, three areas of the conflict to work on. First, we want to work on parties' feelings about Conflict generally, their attitude to conflict generally, are they seeing conflict as something negative? Do they have very negative association with conflict? We want them to know, we want to change that. We want to work also on their field perception of the incompatibility. Are they seeing the incompatibility as totally mutually exclusive? 
as in once this person has it, I cannot have it. Sometimes the things people cast as mutually exclusive are not usually like that. For instance, respect, respect in a relationship. Now, one party is respecting the other does not mean that, I mean, both parties can feel respected. Now, one party feels respected does not mean that the other party must feel disrespected. That's what I'm saying. Some of these fundamental things, they are not mutually exclusive. So we want to work about on the feelings of people about the compatibility. We want to also work on how they communicate, how they talk about this incompatibility. Sometimes people that exacerbate conflicts, interpersonal conflicts, are usually the barometer rules. The people that just can, can, I mean, they're not directly involved, but they now begin to say all kinds of things about the country. So sometimes you want to talk to people to control or to mind the kind of people they talk to. And finally, you want to check how people are acting towards this incompatibility. Are they mobilizing violently? Are they, are they receptive? to so non-violent means, are they using non-violent means? In whatever kind of conflicts we are confronted with, all these things we talked about, how parties in the conflict perceive conflict, how they feel about the incompatibility, how they communicate the incompatibility, how they act towards the perceived incompatibility, all this will combine to determine the nature, the peculiar nature of each conflict, which makes, which will make each conflict to be very unique. Now, this is perception exercise. This is a perception exercise. I want uh, us to look at these three images. Let us look at these three images and interpret them individually. We can we will write our interpretation of each image in our chart. Image one to the left, image two in the middle, image three to the right. What do we see? So let's take two minutes to write down our responses to these images. So, have we, have we interpreted the, the three images? Okay, I can see. Ah, yes, um, Mr. Mr. Lasso come in. Uh, he said two women and a man. Yes, but we want a more descriptive thing, a more descriptive uh, response. 
uh, you say image one, this, image two, this, image three, this. Um, the more descriptive uh, responses. Okay, image one, feeling. Image two, communication. Image three, action. This is interesting. Uh, uh, what do you mean by B? Okay. Madam Khadija Tajayi. Let's keep them coming. Uh, more responses. Please, we need more responses from, okay. Mr. Salami, uh, you want to speak? Okay, please go ahead, unmute yourself and you have the floor. Salam alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum salam. Please in image ahead. three, sir. Image three. In, in that image three, in image three, sir. Image three. Okay, sir. T two women they were discussing. Uh, the husband stand aloof, knowing the kind of hypocrisy that women. Be, maybe the two women belong to the same husband, or the wife now bringing her friend and discussing. The man just stand aloof. Wow. Pretending wow, uh, as if he doesn't hear what they were saying. Wow. That's hello, sir. The, hello, sir. That's the image to the right. Yes, sir. Okay. So you saw two women discussing, and their husband also is there. And uh, yes. he just stands aloof. Okay. That's right. Yes, sir. Good. What about image one and two? Image one. Two, in, yes. in a, in a, okay. Okay. So, how do you interpret image one to the left? Hello, sir. Hello, sir. In, in image one, sir, hmm. maybe it, 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 the woman, the wife, I can see somebody maybe playing music or something in front. You know, at times when women, when they are in conflict with the husband, and if I, all those kind of songs <laughs> that can pink the man, that can make the man to go sad, maybe that is kind of music that the woman is enjoying. Why the man? Just stand aloof. He doesn't want to be provoked. He doesn't want the case to get. You know, this conflict has magnitude. It has intensity. It has uh, intensity. It starts yeah. from argument, then, 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 till it goes to confrontation. And later on, in between two countries, it goes into war. What mm. happened in Ukraine and Russia doesn't start in a day. It started mm. gradually. Mm. Yes, I understand. That's my little contribution, sir. Thank yes, sir. you very much. That's but um, yes, before you go, Yes, sir. Um, are you seeing the three images as one? They are separate images. So the left hand side is an image. No, they are, I'm talking about the first and the, the first and the third images, sir. Okay. Okay, the first and the third. Okay. Tell I can't you. see the second one because I was busy. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, two hands are raised. Okay, Madam Simbia, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm Madam Simbia, Madam Drodola Simbia, please, you have the floor. Hello, sir. Good afternoon, Hello, sir. Good afternoon, ma'am. We can hear you, ma'am. Go ahead. Go ahead, ma'am. Unmute yourself, Madam Simbia. Madam Cynthia, please unmute. Hey. 
Please, Madam Simbi, you have the floor. Unmute. Unmute yourself. We can't hear you because you are muted. Okay. I think we lost her. Uh, okay. Uh, let me read from the chat again. Okay. Uh, Mr. Isaka Shitu says, the man feeling unhappy with the discussion going on between the women. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's, uh, these are new perspectives. Okay, look at it. All of us, we are looking at the same thing and we are interpreting them differently. In some of our past uh, courses, people see the first image as a man that looks forlorn, pensive man, hungry man, some see him as a cool man. But hardly do people see that in that face, one can spell out liar, liar. If you look at it diagonally from the left, from the top, the first image is a writing also that forms liar. Written in cursive and right. L A R. Can we see it? Okay, Madam Simbi at your back. Please go ahead, Madam Simbia. You have the floor. I'm back. Oh, please. I'm sorry, sir. I'm here waiting for somebody. That's right. The person just got in. Okay. I'm talking about image one, sir. Okay, ma'am. Go ahead, ma'am. Hello, sir. Go ahead, ma'am. We can hear you. Uh -huh. So I said image one to me. Seems as if the person there is a, is an office. Uh, Thinking uh, about is a place of work. <laughs> okay, ma. He's thinking about his place of work. Uh, to go in. <laughs> Are you with me, sir? Uh -huh, I lost you. I Hello, hello ma'am. Hello, ma'am. I'm listening, sir. Yes, you said the man is listening. I mean, he has a problem at work or something. So he's thinking about the problem at the place of work. I said the man is thinking about how to go about his uh, work. I okay. love this work. I was thinking about how to go about this. Well, okay. Thank you very much, ma'am. What about the second image? Work. Okay, ma'am. I have that. What about the second image? Uh, I said the second one to me. Since I see she's having discussion with someone and she's and she's uh, uh, smiling at what they were discussing. Maybe the discussion is uh, somehow interesting and she's smiling at, the, at what they are discussing. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. What about the third one? Okay, and the, and the third image. Uh -huh. The third image to me, I want to see her like a, 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 like a lawyer who is who is trying to ruminate over a particular case as to how she will go about the, the, the case of, of her clients. 
Thank you very much, ma, for your wonderful contribution. We really appreciate you. We really thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. From me, Adam Adepo Jualima, the man show his unhappiness through the look on his face as the image one. And from Mr. M M Madam Salahuddin, he says, image three is a woman that is looking away, a woman looking away. Now, you see, the point is that we all look at the same images and we give them very different interpretations. Now, in conflict, these are the kind of things we see. People express the same thing and they give it different interpretations. People look at what other party is doing or saying and they give it entirely different interpretations than what the party is giving to it. That is why it is important we work on people's perception. Okay. Mr. Remila Wang says, the image of the man on the left side reflects unhappiness and frustration. Why the middle one shows a man thinking of sorting out problem, <laughs> sorting out of the problem of the woman before her. <laughs> okay, this is Madam Falsat is using Mr. Remila Wang's phone. Thank you very much for that wonderful interpretation. So, this goes to show us that as conflict managers, perception of people is important. Some of the people we will uh, work with, they come with negative, very negative perception of conflict itself. For them, once there is conflict, it means Yawa don't gas. It means young people scatter scatter. It means fight to finish. Whereas, Apart from the general perception of conflict, they also have perception about that their own particular conflict. Some will have interpreted the conflict as ah, the regeni, ah, it is um, what's the regeni? They want to cheat me. Ah, they want to enslave me. Every conflict party has a perception, a general perception of conflict, and specific perception of that particular conflict is involved in. When we are able to change the perception of parties to a conflict from negative to positive, it goes a long way in resolving that conflict, in managing that conflict. So let's keep that at the back of our minds. The more important thing is that we need to work on our own perception of conflict itself. So essential features of conflict. What are the characteristics as it were of conflict? Conflict is pervasive in our interactions or our relationships. Conflict happens a lot of time. It's just that it's only when it becomes violent that we now see how conflict has started. But many times, conflict is just too numerous. And this is because of our differences, our diversity, and our interdependence. Interdependence means that we need each other. For instance, if you are not interdependent, a husband and a wife that can cook for themselves have different chicken, I mean kitchens, different utensils, different maybe house made and cook for them, different stuff. They may not need, they may not fight over what to eat. But because most times couples share the same food stuff, the same pot, the same this, I mean, these differences of taste of this may lead to conflict at times because of interdependence. Conflict is inevitable. We cannot avoid it. We cannot, it cannot be prevented in a way, as in saying that people will not have incompatibilities. No. Conflict is neutral in a sense, is neither negative or positive. By that we mean that how we handle it is what we determine whether it will be positive or negative to us. 
our attitude and response to it will determine the nature of that conflict and the outcome of the conflict. Conflicts have some benefits that people are not usually aware of. For instance, conflict can make people to be aware of problems. Conflict can make people aware of problems. Just like when we have weak glue in our hand, there will be pain in that finger. Now, the weak glue, the pain in the finger is what will let us quickly attend to the weak We take vaccine, and we take an injection, we take a drug, you may use the traditional method of putting it inside food, inside hot ever, and putting as the battery as you putting engine oil. Just imagine that one can have a weak and there is no pain. Many of us will not take those medications. Many of us won't take the necessary steps until the jam that has that is living in that finger until it is spread to the old hand. And from the hand to the old arm, from the arm, maybe to the old organism, from the head to toe, and the organism, the, the person with that. So the pain of a weak glue is calling our attention. It has advantage. That is sometimes how conflict uh, is. It lets people know there is a problem in this relationship. It can help us promote change, necessary change. What do you mean by necessary change? Take, for example, newlywed couples. The husband works outside the house, the wife works in the house, or she's a full time housemaker. When they just get married, no child, uh, no pregnancy, the wife will prepare food, pack the husband's food, uh, pack, uh, prepare breakfast, pack his lunch. And by the time the husband is coming back from uh, home, I mean from work, the wife will throw herself on her, uh, remove his tie, uh, help him to wash his hands, he lead him to the dining table, all this, all this uh, peppermint stuff. Do it for, for, for him. But a few months' time, the wife takes it. Things begin to change. Later, the wife delivers baby. Throughout the night, she's taking care of the baby. She may not be able to cook for the husband to take to work and pack lunch for him. You see, the husband will get, will start getting angry. And you women, I started showing power now. And you are now showing you are this, you are that. And before the child came, I was the Lord and the, in this house. I was yet. But now, now that you know you have a seat in this house because of this child, now, and uh, you're not doing as you like. The wife will also say, my wife, my husband is no longer affectionate. He's no longer showing this. He's no longer doing that. But the truth is, your relationship has changed. You need to renegotiate it. So conflict, that kind of conflict will promote change. If the two of them have the right attitude to conflict, they will sit down and say, okay, you like to take food to hospital to work? Okay, this is the way you can help. Or you can ask somebody to come and live with us. Or take a housemaid that will help me with taking care of my of the baby at night. Then I can attend to you. Then the whole arrangement is set again. So conflict has benefits. It helps us to improve solutions. It raises morale. Uh, it fosters personal development. It enhances psychological maturity. It helps people to grow, to become mature, uh, and so on. Uh, the negatives of conflict, that is the disadvantages of conflict, we, we are too familiar with all these things. OK. The language of conflict through metaphor is a group activity. Each group have been given uh, one to ponder at a group level. You ponder it and then you ask, you answer these five questions. For instance, conflict is a battle where only one can be left standing. 
Anybody that has this language of conflict, how we lead see conflict, how we lead relate to conflict, is, is, is that perspective, is it negative, positive, or neutral? For somebody that sees conflict as a battle, it means I must crush my opponent. That is the mindset. Only me can be left standing. So such an individual will not be looking for mutually beneficial agreement or arrangement. What he wants is I must vanquish that fellow or the fellow will vanquish me. So this is what the activity is about. In each group, the one that has been assigned to us, let us ponder over it and then answer these five questions. We won't be able to, today is not the day we'll be presenting, be presenting that. Okay, what are the causes of conflict? Causes of conflicts. When we talk about causes of conflicts, we are talking about factors that contribute to people's grievances. We've talked about good. Okay, uh, sorry for that uh, each. So we, we were on uh, causes of conflict. So we talked about incompatible goals, about uh, how we pursue incompatibility and so on and so forth. But beyond this, some of the Causes of conflicts include perception, as we have talked about, approaches to conflict, poor communication skills, goals, personal differences, resources, power plays, and manipulations. Um, however, we can break or categorize, rather, we can categorize the causes of conflict into these groups. Structural causes, proximate causes, and triggers. Structural, proximate, and triggers. The structural causes of conflict are factors that are built into policies, structures, and fabric of a society, and which may increase the likelihood of violence. The other time we talked about structural violence. So structural violence are resources, they are structural factors. Structural factors, which, like I said, are our policies, laws, that will increase the likelihood of violence. Proximate causes are factors that make an atmosphere conducive for violent conflict or its escalation. For instance, the current election period. Election is a proximate factor for causing ethnic conflict. Look at the vituperations, the yes, that have been seen on social media, especially between the Yorubas and the Igbos, over Lagos, over this, over that. You see? The structural factors were there before. But the election is making the atmosphere more conducive for likelihood of violence. We have triggers. Triggers of conflict refer to single acts, events, or the anticipation that sets off or escalates violent conflict. Triggers affect the timing of the onset of the violent conflict, explaining why the conflict started at that moment and not why it started. Triggers, these are single acts. Maybe, God forbid, between the Yoruba and the Osa now, like yesterday we had the rumor that, oh, they have started attacking or vandalizing Igbo people's shop. 
Thank God that the police came out this morning to say it is not true. But if, God forbid, if somebody now, maybe one Agbero, one area boy now goes to vandalize or to loot the shop of an Igbo man, it can lead to reprisal and then violence, violence will break out. Violence will break out. So, causes of conflict may be many, but they can be grouped into structural, proximate, and then triggers. What that means for us as conflict managers is that once we have a conflict is brought to our attention, we want to look at, we want to look beneath the surface. We don't want to look at the trigger alone. Oh, he slapped me. That's why I slapped back. And then we started fighting. Two people that are at peace with themselves, you not just slap themselves and they will start uh, fighting. No, it doesn't work like that. The slap might have been the trigger. The slap by one party might have been the trigger. But what made the slap necessary? What, okay, you now see that the person that was slapped has been singing proverbial songs against the person that slaps. Okay. But before the proverb, now that the proverbial songs is what made the slap possible, then the proverbial songs now become the proximate factors. But what, is, what first led to the singing of proverbial songs? You now find out that, okay, they are wives of, of the same man, but the one man seems to prefer one to the other and show open favoritism. Oh, this is the structure on which the whole thing is based. So, if you want to set that kind of conflict, if we limit it to the two wives without addressing the structure of the husband that openly show preference for one at the expense of the other, we may not have permanent solution. We may not have permanent solution to that conflict. So a good way of illustrating the relationship between structural, proximate, and triggers of conflict is this. Let's look at God. AK-47, for example. AK-47. AK-47 that has its safety latch on is not dangerous. You can use it to pound, you can kick it around, you can use it for anything. You can use it like any other not so straight stick or staff. You can use it as a staff. However, once you now remove the safety catch, it becomes potentially dangerous. It becomes potentially dangerous. You see, the engineering of AK-47, the metal, the boots, they are not ample. Those constitute the structure, the design, the structure of the gun. Proximate factor is the presence of bullets in it and the removal of safety catch from the gun. We know that once a gun is loaded and the safety catch is returned, I mean, is removed, that gun sometimes can even fire itself. That's why we have accident, accidental discharge. That gun can fire itself. But we know that ordinarily guns will not fire themselves. We need to pull the trigger. It is when we pull the trigger that the gun now becomes a deadly machine. So structural factors of conflict may not lead to conflict, may not lead to violence, but they form the base for it. The same thing goes for proximate factors, but it triggers conflict. Now, generally, 
scientists have put up some explanation about causes of conflict. We are looking at four of them, human needs theory, human needs explanation, relational explanation, political explanation, and transformative explanation. You see, the argument of each of these uh, theory is different. Human needs theory says, unfulfilled or non-satisfaction of human needs is the cause of conflict. That there are some basic human needs, physical, psychological, economic, social, and spiritual needs that must be met for a man not to go into conflict. People like recognition, they like identity, security, autonomy, bonding. That if these universal human needs are deprived, it will lead to violent expressions. So, some of the conflicts we handle as conflict managers are based on the uh, deprivation of human needs. Relational explanation or relational theory says our relationship, our need to relate, and the fact that we are different, this is why we have conflicts. We have explained that uh, at length in our differences and then the interdependence of our relationship. So that is the argument of the relational theory. Political theory says that power, struggle for power, use of power, misuse or abuse of political power are the reasons for conflict. And a good case in point is uh, what is currently happening in Nigeria. Oh, the ruling party, they didn't do well. Oh, they did well. Oh, we need to seize power in order to have access to resources, and so on and so forth. That this struggle, struggle for power, is the reason for conflict. We've seen that a lot in Nigeria. How people are killed, maimed, properties destroyed because people want to have access to political power, because people are misusing political power, because people are abusing political power. Transformative theory says conflict is caused by responses to structural or systemic injustices and inequality that has been woven into our system. That people, how they respond to change is the cause of conflict. Forces of change, how mm -hmm. the forces of change influence people, these are the reasons for conflict. Okay, uh, for now, we want to stop here uh, for the purpose of uh, going for prayers. Uh, before we finally call it uh, uh, off for this session, we want to see whether we have any questions so far. Questions? Mr. Gbola Adiamo, any question? Okay, Madam Shakira. Madam Shakira, Allah, I can see your hand. Please proceed. You have the floor. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam, Alaja. Who is hearing me? Assalamu alaikum. Yes, ma'am. Wa alaikum salam. I can hear you, ma'am. Wa alaikum salam. Allah, we're hearing you. Okay, can I go ahead? Please do. Can I go ahead with the question? Please go ahead, ma'am. Okay. Yes. You... Okay. okay. So in the course of the presentation, when we're talking about uh, conflict resolution, 
you talked about when they when there is conflict that it is better to go to find out the, the structural cause that is what actually led to the conflict and not uh, the triggers or just the things that we can see. So what I've observed uh, over time is that, especially when it comes to conflict uh, between in, in the marital setting between husbands and wives, sometimes it is difficult for those that are uh, attending or trying to mediate into the matter to get to the roots of the matter. The, the, the parties involved in the conflict usually do not give full, full information of the cause of that conflict to those handling it. So making it difficult for them to settle the conflict, especially, I'm sorry, especially on the part of the men, most times, maybe out of ego or something like that. They don't want to open up to tell those involved about what is actually causing it. So I, I think how do one get to the roots? How do we as conflict managers get to the roots in such situation? So it's about do the people attend to that conflict how do you, do, do you resolve that? How do you get to know the truth? Okay. Thank you very much, Ma, for that wonderful question. Hope you heard um, me. Clearly, clearly, I did. Clearly, I did. Uh, to paraphrase, what you're asking is that many times in conflict, in family disputes, it is difficult to get to the root because the popular belief is that the couples will not reveal the main issue and especially the men, maybe out of ego or something. But I have said that it is necessary we get to the structural foundation of the conflict. So now asking how do we do that as conflict managers? You see, there are some popular beliefs that are contrary to practice, best practices when you are a trained conflict manager. Uh, a trained conflict manager, like you said, must get to the root. And he has been trained, he has tools, he has ways of asking questions to get to the root. May I tell you that as a conflict manager, you are being trained to be like medical doctors who must ask sometimes, who must sometimes ask difficult questions from his patient to be able to get to the root of the problem in order to be able to prescribe uh, appropriately. Some of the things we'll be covering in this uh, course is conflict analysis. And is the I'll be giving you some tools to use to get to the roots. Look at the illustration I gave about that woman with four children fighting over an orange. The woman had to listen to them. You see, what the what the children were talking about is what we refer to in conflict management as their positions. I want the orange. I want the orange. A good conflict manager knows that he cannot solve uh, or manage a conflict well based on position. For instance, if the mother said, okay, you want the orange, you want the orange before, okay, I have only one orange, I'm going to cut it into four. She wouldn't have solved the problem very well. The children would take it grudgingly, but the woman, the mother went to the level, she went from position to the level of interest why do you need it she moved from interest to the level of need need of each child that was when she realized that one orange can satisfy everybody a man that beat his wife because somebody gave him us whip to cure the madness of his wife to require the madness of the, in the head of his wife if you appeal to him I say, but you are learned now, you are this now. 
that may not work until you realize now say ah that one is culturally wrong go the imam that gave me that one he didn't do well by giving it to you that is not right so are you aware that the law of the land says this and that and that that is when you are getting to the foundation of that thing so conflict managers will be keyed with the knowledge skills and abilities to be able to help parties get to the root of their problem you see in family dispute you said parties sometimes they don't want to reveal sometimes parties don't even know they don't even know their need they cannot articulate their needs but this kind of training will help you to help parties identify their interests their needs just like a medical doctor we help patients patients just be saying i have pain i have pain this is i'm expressing this but by a series of questions series of questions do this do this bend down stand up okay well then the doctor will to say madam this is your problem this is what has caused it and this is how to treat it is that clear ma have i answered your question ma yes 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 thank you very much uh any other one i think uh is there another one that we can quickly do before we go for prayers okay in the absence of norm i don't know mr gola mr gola adiamo do you have anything to say okay alaja shitu kudrat okay you you mute a second here okay uh, i want to say very big thanks to all of us that stayed through till this time uh we are very sorry for the issues we had uh in the morning uh after prayers we're going to have a session that will last for about one and a half hours please let's tell our our team members our group members to join the network is now reasonably very reasonably stable here where i have the, is no longer windy as it was in the morning so once again we thank you very much for your patience and we look forward to seeing you uh by two o'clock by two o'clock thank you very much bye everyone we can now go for prayer and uh, break thank you Thanks, Mr. Lawal. We use the same login details for the afternoon. <laughs>